because um, I'm going to be at the time. You ready? Yeah. Ready to rumble? Yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> Welcome everybody to our first Cold Gallery Artist Talks. Apologise for the, uh, you know, sort of the figuring it all out because it's the first time. But uh, thanks for coming. And we've got two fantastic artists to start us off the talks. We've got um, Howard Eaglestone and uh, Kathleen Greenwood. Um, so we've got wonderful painter and printmaker. Um, yeah, so uh, Howard, uh, he's been um, an art teacher, head, head of, was head of painting for the BA uh, Fine Art course in Bradford College for, with, with, with 30 years of experience. So it's a wealth of knowledge and and uh, and painting knowledge, um, and you've got some paintings up in the show. And we have Catherine, who who is uh, been, uh, printmaking. Um, she did a masters in in Maine. Um, she showed the Royal College of Art, um, the summer show. Uh, you, she did a fellowship with City and Guilds, um, and uh, sort of the description of her, of her work she's showing in the show. Uh, the, the, um, she makes etchings of monoprints um, based on uh, 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 coastal walks, observing nature, responding to seasonal changes, the landscape. Um, yeah, f fantastic, inspiring stuff. Um, and so the, the sort of format we're going to do, uh, Catherine's going to talk for 15 minutes about her practice, and, um, and then Howard will talk, and uh, we'll have some questions. Is that about right, how we yeah, set it yeah. up? Um, <coughs> but we can be sort of easy and flowing about it. Um, yeah. Let's see if you have any dying questions. You... Yeah, maybe I'll see at the end. Uh, yeah, questions at the end. Um, so we'll get sidetracked in our words. Super. Okay. So, are yeah, you ready to go? Great. I'll move out of the way. Yes, you can go here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, wherever you want. I can, I can. Lovely to have Annabelle, my niece, who's now a student. He's a dance student, and my sister-in-law, 
Liz, and we've done a lot of sort of arty projects together. So this is another another venture in Leeds. So the work I've, I've got on the walls here is um, I'm a printmaker primarily, but I, I would also see myself as a painter printmaker. Um, and these are monotypes, which are like one of a kind, um, and they're water in watercolour, um, except this one, which is a oil-based. Um, yeah. Um, oil-based ink monotype and there's going to be a few more coming in and they're, they're just a lot stronger, richer colours and I hadn't realised until I started doing these again that they very much connect to my early work when I was a student at Camberwell and um, messing around with paint, didn't really know what I was doing um, and squishing it through the press from a big plate so the way these are done is they are painted and I'll show you on the slides in a minute um, I paint on a big piece of aluminium or perspex, lay damp paper on the plate and it goes through a giant press and you'll see, I'll show you that, um, and then the image is transferred onto the paper. Um, so they are sort of like printed paintings I suppose and the, I think the reason I like it is rather than, you know, why not just paint on paper, paint on canvas or something like that, which I have done. But they just seem to have that alive quality and they it captures the drips, it captures the splats, it captures the moment when the paint fuses and you, I sort of hair dry them or I dry them on a big hot plate. Um, and I think it's that sort of transience that I want to capture, that sort of slightly ephemeralness of them. Um, especially probably this one is the most sort of sucking soft, almost barely there. Um, wisp of wind or something. Um, and then this one's probably a little bit stronger. I think the, my only frustration with them is with being watercolour, um, you're limited by the amount of paint you can actually get out of the palette, so the amount you can load your brush, and I use big Japanese brushes. Um, the great thing is you have all those fabulous colours uh, in your paint box and you get very quick at you know, knowing your colours. With printing inks, for example this one, um, it would take me about two hours to lay out all the colours that I want and by the time I've squeezed out enough tubes of colour, I'll be so tired I want to go for a drink or something. <laughs> but, um, so what I tend to do is prepare them in a pot now or have them on a palette ready for when I'm back in the studio. Um, anyway, I'm going to show a few um, And so you'll see that quite a lot of my work is colourful but equally um, I seem to yo-yo between night and day and I think that's at the moment my current influence is um, there's a, a piano piece that my son is playing um, called Night and Day it's a jazz piece and it's by Bill Evans, I don't know if any of you are jazz heads but he, it, it just um, and the nocturnes of Chopin, I'm quite influenced by music I'm, I'm a musician as well and this one is quite a large monotype etching and it was done from uh, going to a frozen lake and I'm trying to look at the spaces in between so you'll see this in a lot of my work that I'm really almost as much fascinated by the things I don't put in as the things I put in hence the sort of squished painting that's you know could have gone further but I decided to capture it before it was overdone probably <laughs> um, so this one is called frozen time inverted because I, as um, Johnson and I were laughing about Thermi, I try and be a bit of a tech head, I'm a classic tech head that's quite good at it, and then when it comes to the crunch, you go, oh no, which button do I press? Um, I messed around on the computer with one of my monotypes and then ended up having an image that I was actually more pleased with. You'll see the original in a minute. So this is a tiny little film. Process. So I tend to go out in the wilds, any weather really, um, painting normally in watercolour or ink, and then I'll come back into the studio, turn it into a drawing, and this is the big press that I work on. So I make a lot of etchings, and I teach etching at Putney School of Art and at City and Guilds. This is City and Guilds, where I did a fellowship with Jason Hickley, who, um, and Norman Ackwood had set up the room. So. This is one of my sort of landscapes, probably my sort of dark work, um, just to show you the sort of process. And I think a lot of my work is quite process based. 
Um, so that's, that's that. So this is the, the press. I've recently been invited down to Suffolk to teach at there, and I'm very. Um, I've trained in traditional printmaking, tr traditional etching techniques, but I went to Japan and, um, and actually on my MA when I was in America, I um, studied non-toxic etching, so I'm quite passionate, or well, very passionate about the environment and the impact of solvents and all that sort of things. I'm always seeking alternatives, but um, the lure of the traditional etching is aquatint, and I think anyone that knows anything about printmaking, aquatint is the fine resin dust settles on an etching plate, you fuse it with fire, and it's that sort of alchemy that I love. Um, so if I, if I ever do a PhD, or I'm just even toying with the idea that I might do some research into aquatins and how that can be removed without mess or white spirits, and maybe there's an alternative um, to the varnishes and solvents, because in sort of greener, safer printmaking methods, they're using acrylic sprays, and I don't necessarily feel acrylic is Forward in. So whatever, I like natural stuff, so I'm a bit of a hybrid, so I'm teaching in, in Suffolk. Um, this is a close-up detail of one of the, the watercolours, watercolour monotypes. This, is, this was actually last week, um, I discovered a new process, that's what I love about printmaking, is that you're constantly finding new ways of working. and. Um, see how messy it gets. Um, this is quite late at night and I was exploring the inks, these sort of rich ink colours, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to paint off my palette um, to hell with the, you know, being careful with the paint colours. Um, and then using Japanese paper, which is this lovely Kozo paper, um, directly from the palette, didn't go through the press. Um, this is plate before it's printed. So sometimes I like those more, and I sometimes think, why don't I just leave them on the aluminium? Which I could do, um, but I just love printing. So I think it's, oh, this is, I had to include this. Um, my sister. We, so shared sunset is something that I've been thinking about recently, and particularly through the pandemic. Um, sunsets became very important in our family, and I think to a lot of people, especially with Tilly, we would go out chasing sunsets. It was sort of the highlight of the day if there was one. And this is actually at the top of Glastonbury Tor. And I think sunsets, I just notice when people talk about them, they have them in their mind as a sort of shared experience with someone or a loved one, or it's a place to go in your mind when, I don't know how, how you all coped with the pandemic, but I personally, it, I think it was, it was pretty hard for most people in unexpected ways. And um, to have that sort of place to go mentally, I found really, really great. And I, I just love this photo. It's, we got to watch the sunrise on the solstice. And, oh, it was Easter day? Easter day. But we might as well have been solstice. Um, and I'll go back, I'll show you some sort of quite dark images in a minute. But I had a burst of colour. I think working on my fellowship, had got very intense and very sort of dark and colour was sort of taboo in the studio. It was very um I was using colourful and sort of secretly get out my pink and do a great big pink thing. Um, I've always loved colour and my mum is a real colourist and I did start doing these little watercolours. This I'm really talking about my current work, I'm not gonna go right back, but at some point it'd be nice to talk about that. So these slides are a little bit of a hot potch. That's that one upside down big sort of on the metal. Um, and this is again showing the working practice. I was doing a demo in the studio and I quite often work from a remembered experience for my sketchbooks and it will be a way of reconnecting. Um, sometimes I show the work that I made in situ um, but quite often I develop an idea and I'll do I'll just thrash an idea to bits. I'll sort of Sunset, 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 and then suddenly it will become lakes. Um, and the next thing for me is going to be um, memorations, so I'm working with bird memorations. So I'll whiz through, through these a little bit. It's nice birds. <laughs> so this is another monotype, so you can see a, um, an inky drawing, and then with a monotype next to it. Um, that's the hot plate. 
this, I took a little plate with me out um, into the wild, so did they want to come in? You can watch today. Um, I take people on art oh, walks, yeah. painting and drawing, yeah, they want to come in. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the, uh, my first memoration of paintings. Oh, you're welcome. There's a chair in the front. Oh dear. Yeah, there you are. Come through, come through. There's a chair in the front. That's great, thank you. Don't worry, it's a good one. Yeah. So, this is one of the first memories. Yeah. Yeah.
sorry, I'm jumping around here a little bit. This is one I've tried to put in my sort of iconic images. Um, this one was selected by Norman Ackroyd for the RA summer show. Um, and I do work with photography quite a lot. I don't often show my photos. I tend to use it for community projects or dance projects. Um, and it's Silvery Hill, and I've put in a sort of a figure into the hill as a photo montage. And it's really questioning our existence, kind of questioning the role of the human and the land, or the connection of the human and the land with this earth monument. So I have a sort of bubbling series of this sort of work that goes on. It sort of underpins my work, but I don't often make them. Um, similarly, this was a study for, I painted 100 swallows so that when I did matching, it came out <laughs> like a, a dancing swallow gesture. I think we're going to have them, one of those in the gallery. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, two, two of them, two, yes, yeah, two, 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 two mounted as we speak. That's right, yes, they've been mounted on some lovely frames. So this is um, a monotype, uh, an etching, um, petals, shadow work. This is the one that you know well. Mm -hmm. um, this image has been quite sort of emblematic in a sense that it's sort of it's a seed head it's a cost uh, allium. allium seed head thank you um, and it's almost become like a cosmos or an energy burst a lot of people have connected with it which was quite a surprise it's, it's was done as an etching into the act and um, then I've enlarged it on the canvas so it's quite big um, I've quite worked to enlarge it on glass and put it in I don't know I've got sort of mad ideas for it but it's quite nice just as it is that size um, and that was an etching drawing made of it, just trying to show that I quite often take an idea and progress with it through different mediums. That's a really quite a detailed dry point etching. Um, I'm going to move here. This is a, a giant plate. No, it's not going to move. It's really etching. It's a hot colour, gosh, yeah. Someone um, showed me what, you know, these vibrant colours that have hit the market. Um, you have to go to an art shop. I went into Leeds, that shop. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, you know, there's nothing like new paint to get an artist doing. This is what triggered all these sunsets. Just that, playing with Sarah's paintings. Is that be true as well? Isn't it? Yeah, I'm <laughs> so much lunch, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, those colours, I think, it's like the memory of the sunset. Just, I think if you're going to colour it, can just I only have to see a bit of paint and I'm off. Um, as you can see. <laughs> so this that's a little print, it's tiny, it's this big. It's part of um, an open press project printed on a 3D printed press. Uh, to do with nightingales and walking to see nightingales um, in a thicket. Um, there we go. This is just a working in progress. Okay. The oil, oil, yeah. oil income, yeah. You think it's that one? Maybe it's that one. Yeah, I did want to fall in love with these colours. This was the breakthrough I had on the palette with the Cosa paper. And, up, and I just wanted to touch on this at the end. Um, it's been really fab working with Tilly, and the guy on the right with the hat is a composer who, again, during lockdown, it's just one of my etchings, and we've ended up doing a collaboration where we've written an album together, and, and Tilly has interpreted it in dance. So, if you ever want to look at my website, there's some links to, to the dance. I'd love to, I might play it later, but I'm aware that how many people want to And that's me in my, in my apron. <laughs> I think that's it, yeah. Oh, um, well, last thing to say, I'm very um, inspired by Helen Frankenfeller, whose yeah. exhibition is on at the moment. And um, seeing her show, I don't know if any of you have seen it in uh, in Dulwich. Have you seen it? Oh my goodness. I was it's so. The woodcuts. Yeah, giant woodcuts printed. Um, they're so I wish I'd seen it. I've seen the picture. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it made it cool. It was absolutely blown me away. And I think I had forgotten about her. And it, it was another reconnection where I, when I was a student, I got a book out of the library, 
probably my first term or something, and kept it for the whole three years I was there. And, and then, you know, and I did these giant big flooded canvases, and I think with the abstraction, I only got so far before I wanted to get into symbolism, and I, I couldn't quite push it through. Um, and so I became more representational. She, she has no, it's like no, no gesture, is it? It's pure all... abstraction. I mean, I don't know if I would want to go that far. Hers are just amazing. She has a whole team of people behind her to make her prints, or did have. Um, but anyway, I came back from the exhibition and inked up on my etchings in every single colour I could find using the hyperextended inks that she um, had used. So that, that was a really lovely, lovely thing, and it sort of helped me, you know, have confidence in the colour because I was feeling a bit like, oh, I can't use colour, it's, you know, that's that. That's the palette, so I've been keeping little tickets with the colours that I love. Um, and, oh, this is the, um, I printed on silk as well, so I'll just leave it with that. So pleasing. I know, nothing like the reveal. <laughs> so thank you very much.
Sometimes openings can be stressful, but I echo what Catherine said, that it's so enjoyable. And uh, I think this is uh, it's such a great addition to Leeds. Fantastic. Um, Joss mentioned that I taught, and I suppose I should start by saying that um, my practice is probably as a, a teacher practitioner for most of my life. And I taught at the art school at Bradford and ended up head of painting, uh, working there for many years. And they used to say that those who can paint who, and those who can't teach, I think that is absolutely nonsense because teaching was a great privilege and one of the great delights of teaching is that Ian Hodgson, uh, who's also in the show, was a student at Bradford 25 years ago, and I worked uh, with um, Ian, and I think that um, it's just so wonderful to be showing with him again. It just uh, happens, that so, wasn't it? Just yeah, yeah just, just, just not by design. But, uh, no, it just, just happened. And then when I found out, I, I was, you know how excited I was. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, when I finished at Bradford, I took early retirement. Um, I, while I was at Bradford, I was responsible for the Erasmus programme, and particularly for the connection between um, um, Bradford and Bilbao in Spain. And when I finished at Bradford, I taught for about six years in Bilbao as a visiting uh, lecturer uh, on the MA in painting. And I just want to put in a word for Erasmus, because personally, I'm very European, and I'm disgusted about what has happened. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's that. <laughs> Get that. Um, I knew that Catherine was going to talk about uh, process and we both think that that is very important in the practice of making things and so I, I brought this extra painting in to show you because it's got further elements of uh, process in it like the embedded magnetic field and again it's so nice listening to talks on that because um, just looking at Catherine's the hill with the figure in it, or with the the seed explosion. I I kind of see I do see uh, overlapping kind of interests in things, which um, it, and it's such a delight to have access to a person's work through what how they're they're talking about it. 
If I, I talk about kind of my work and say, I'll just s s start with this one perhaps. Um, the way I, I like to work is I'm surprised by what I come across. This is just a still life uh, that was in a, a kitchen at home which I just came across some plastic bowls in the sunlight. And I always generally find that um, I'm more surprised by what exists outside than where he said, um, if we try to imagine monsters, they'll always end up with teeth and claws. And to some extent, I'm interested in this relationship between the imagination inside, but the imagination that exists with what we come across outside us. So most of the work I do it is uh, a, a response to what happens outside, and then it becomes a bit like a, ta a tennis match between paying homage to what exists outside and then allowing the painting to develop its own stories. Uh, these plastic bowls, just mixing bowls, were in the sunlight and the inside bowl was orange and it immediately made me think of the sun which was shining in it. But ellipses, which I, which I love, um, like, and, and in this painting, for me they become like orbits, they're like planets orbiting the sun. And another delight in being in Cole's gallery, there's many ellipses around, so I think my paintings are at home. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the side, all the signage is ellipses as well. Uh, and so when, when I did this, uh, the painting started, I wanted to, to start developing a response to what I was finding. And so the starting point is the still life in the kitchen and it becomes a catalyst for stories. And then I thought, it's just amazing really with the solar system, and uh, Tilly, we need your sister here, she's a scientist, but um, I like the fact that when they talk about the Earth being in the Goldilocks zone, and of course this golden colour was part of that, and all these amazing um, chances and events which allowed life to begin on Earth, and one of the things as well which is fabulous I think is the magnetic fields and how it protects the earth from sunlight. So I wanted to embed, the, I knew that the magnetic field would be elliptical and would uh, fit within the, um, the orbits of the, uh, the basins or the bowls. I had to work out, I don't know, you can just you, you can just see the the drawing where I laid the bar magnet down underneath, and then I just dropped the iron filings on onto the painting. And it's amazing; they do seem to fix themselves, but then I would fix it and um, varnish over it. Um, but the the bottom half of the painting. It's just um, reflections through glass on the, but it seemed to me to almost start to form like a jawline of teeth. And I love the idea of when, when the earth began, it was just like rocks and inert material, but then there was a magical moment when life began. And this green for me represents like the green of photosynthesis and so this bottom passage becomes almost like um, uh, a petri dish for life beginning in this situation. But my whole thing about this, I suppose, is ecological and thinking about the preciousness and the delicacy of uh, the world we live in. 
and how we need to really make a substantial effort to, to, to actually to change. So that is basically the story behind that painting. These two paintings were painted just before the Pentagon released its um, information about the UFOs, which didn't really amount to didn't really amount to anything. Um, I love science, but I because I've had a, a lifetime in art, I'm ignorant of most science that, that you know the architecture of science. But I do love science fiction, and to some extent, this comes out of childhood. Um, there was a wonderful film called The Forbidden Planet, which is a classic science fiction film with a classic um, flying saucer in it. Um, and I'm also interested in my practice now uh, in the relationship between play and creativity. Um, Baudelaire, he talked about uh, the toy being the child's initiation into art. But as the child grows up, the child is forced to give away the toys and take up art as a substitute. But art never has the same imaginative warmth or strength that the toy have. So when I'm doing playing with these things, it's for me um, playing as a child, but hopefully with the lifetime experience. But that this, this little flying saucer is just a plastic cap off our parasol in the garden. And it's placed on a, a it was a, pl a pale green plastic tablecloth. And to me, it was the perfect flying saucer. But that, again, a bit like this, I'm just fascinated by the idea that intelligent life must exist throughout the universe and 50 years ago you might have been thought um, crazy for saying that but now of course they have SETI and they're spending billions of pounds searching for extraterrestrial intelligence and so on but I'm just kind of so fascinated by why and how intelligence emerged and whether it's imminent within the universe, whether it's embedded in the universe and what will come of the route through human beings because um, it's not conclusive yet that, I mean, it, I think intelligence must um, evolve through many different mechanisms and it's evolving through us but whether we're going to be smart enough to make it successful, I don't, I, I don't know. But in a, in a way, I regard these paintings as playfully engaging in problems and deeper thoughts which I've thought about throughout my life. So uh, it's about that. It is about um, when you make things, and it was interesting listening to Catherine about her engagement with the process of making, with etching and the aquatine. And it's funny to think about painting. When we, when we think about all the modern media, and we're working in oil paint and etching, which are all technique, old techniques, but the making process, and I think the time-based nature of it, the physical engagement, the thinking over a period of time, is really important. And especially perhaps today, as maybe uh, thinking is very fast and very entertaining. But listening to Catherine or thinking about how what painting means um, to me, uh, I love the, the slow, the slow growing of thoughts and ideas and the um, response to the activity of the painting. So um, I suppose I, I uh, can think, I mean, I've just, just with this one, I mean, Gavin uh, was mentioning about that why I left the cross the cross there. With this painting, it, 
the situation is like a collage where the lamp is probably a 50s lamp from some hotel somewhere. But when they were, were um, releasing the Pentagon information, many of the images of UFOs that you see are from fighter pilots, so you get this kind of grid up in the, in the canopy of the cockpit. And the, so I left that in as a kind of pun based on that, but it's also, I work in geometry a lot of the time. I, I, that's how the, the painting is underpinned for me. And when I uh, work in the geometry, sometimes if you go up to it, you'll, I, I'm quite happy to leave some of the, the, the lines and marks kind of just exposed to how, how the painting has come about from the beginning to the end. Um, so, well, I think um, might as well leave it at that and look for, because I mean, I personally, I could have, would rather respond to your questions than, <laughs> than, than talk about it, but uh, fantastic. there we go. We <laughs> Love hearing you speak about 
the different components of your painting. And I thought it was really, really interesting with the geometric form underneath it. You can really see that you've got that construct. And then, yeah, that was something that I was going to say underneath my pictures. I have a sort of a golden mean ratio, um, and I'll draw diagonals and things like that. So I think that, yeah, I love that. I've been really drawn to that little cross and wondering about it. And it, um, and I, I also think with the time-based thing that the freshness that you've got, your colour mixing is so perfect that uh, it's exquisite and um, you know they maintain they've got that longevity in them but they've also got that more spontaneity and freshness in them as well um, I was just going to ask you about the symbolism of colour and I loved what you said about the gold but could you maybe think about what you said about the green but is there an overriding colour that you're drawn to um, I've been recently I've been doing paintings on the green scale um, and some on, on the red scale um, the, the greens the green for me is I mean I, I always think I think that humanity lives on a, a bloody seesaw and the green scale for me is like um, um, or what the, the word is before plants photosynthesis yes. but it's also about night vision and military behavior so for me, the, the colours are kind of, I want them to, to kind of hover between two things. When I was a student, Lawrence Gowing was the professor at Leeds, and we had a crit once, and he, he said, and I had to show a painting, and he slammed me, he said, the artist has been seduced by copper. Yeah. <laughs> I think I still am seduced. Yeah, well, that's what I've tried to reconcile through. But uh, um, yeah, I mean the the geometry. I when I was at school, I was being trained to be an engineering draftsman, and we did engineering drawing. And when I start a painting, and Whenever I start something, I think starting is the hardest point. Once you get into it, you can do it. So you have these kind of structural um, rituals to, to get into the painting, and the, the geometry uh, is the way that I start, so that the painting uh, will start as a grid, but the grid is really not on just about transferring information to the canvas but about recognizing the composition of the canvas and uh, the proportions of where things actually actually lie um, but um, it is it's a strange it's a, it's a strange <coughs> business making things and um, but maybe I should ask you something too. As well, well it, I, I, it's interesting to, also to come back and ask you about colour because um, the black and white ones seem to have a very kind of Japanese quality, which, and I love with kind of brass eyes sometimes the black and white uh, photographs uh, because they have less information almost. They they. We, we have a lot of high resolution at the moment, and like, like with both of us, a lot of high key colour. Sometimes uh, when the viewer has to make up, uh, has to engage with the image through uh, seeing limited information, and I sense that with some of your black and white stuff, I, I really like that. Um, and of course, both the, the ones which I felt connected with uh, with my work were the seed explosion and the Sil silvery hill, um, and again it's it's that magical quality about sil silvery hill. Um, so it's kind of it's, it, I've I've gone into more monochrome in the sense that there'll be either green or red. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to explore, but I, I do love this paint, this smaller print, I very much. Um, and 
I, I think one of the things I really enjoyed about this is when we were watching your the film of you and you had your sketchbook there and you were doing the watercolour and you could see those heavy grey clouds and suddenly this um, uh, came alive in how I understood what it was what it was about and how the process replicated in some ways the um, the energy and of weather and things mm. things like that. I think it is, yeah, definitely trying to communicate energy on some yeah. level, sort of that life force. Mm. Um, I was thinking about the, the monochrome idea. Um, for me, I think going to the icy lakes, so go, walking in winter and in snow, the whole, I lived for two years in, in America in Maine, and the whole world did go this black and white monochrome yeah. colour, and you walk through the woods, do you remember? Mm. There? And you are like in a drawing yeah. with the snow, and I, I absolutely love that, although I knew I was craving colour. But it was similar with that lake, it was sort of the whole world had become this monochrome world, which I think, particularly with etching, you'll understand this, you are condensing everything into this tonal qualities. And, um, and I'm lucky enough to be able to dabble in film and things like that, and I did make quite a lot of films at lake, and I turned them all into black and white just so that I could simplify what I was doing. And I think the sort of Japanese idea of um, the spaces in between and the sort of equal importance of light and dark, um, just trying to pare it down for me, taking away the colour really helped and then it's really exploring those shapes and different shades of grey and line, um, thinking in neutral terms, it was a really important part of it and I think then coming back to making some colour work and it's almost like summer and winter, you know, day and night, that whole sort of longing for sun and I do really 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 love the sunshine yeah, yeah. and I think that then is all to do with the existence and questioning who we are and you know stand on a beach it sort of it really connects you with that primal instinct of what, what on earth we're doing here <laughs> so yeah in a roundabout way that sort of connects <laughs> and I love the word murmuring as well because I can see just that the the sound of the word murmuring uh, being a, a catalyst for action within your your work because I, I can see murmuring etchings. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, yeah, well, <laughs> Any other any, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm interested in uh, going back to my sort of childhood really. Mm -hmm. um, well, when I became a student we went around the Doctor Who set at the BBC television centre. Um, it was interesting as a kid watching Doctor Who on television and then realising that the spaceships were vacuum cleaning parts. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we went onto this set and it was domestic items mm -hmm. that had been sent into outer space. And I love the way of taking a, a mo like a motorway service station lamp yeah. of the M6 in 1972, that sort yeah. of thing. And of course the oranges and the greens and all those colours are now you've put it in as something else, but it works really well. I love the colours and how it's all put together. That's why it, it brings sort of those memories back to me of that period and Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> well, I